Hello and welcome back to Mr. X Calor. My name is Arthur and today we are looking at Legacy Arms Teutonic War Sword. Uh, this is uh, a sword that was designed for Legacy Arms by Bruce Brookhart who used to uh, back in the 90s work for Museum Replicas Limited. It's a name some of you guys may know. I actually bought this sword from a distributor that's, that's uh, sold Legacy Arms for a very long time. That's a company called Buy the Sword. So for those of you who are uh, looking at this from Buy the Sword, hope you guys are enjoying this. Um, this is a very interesting buy and the main reason is because of some history behind the Legacy Arms name. The Legacy Arms brand used to be also known as Generation 2. Uh, this was one of the first online sellers of swords back in the 1990s. And uh, they were also one of the first brands that were selling their own products. And they were known for these big, heavy, clunky swords. Uh, they were made in the Philippines. One of, the other, one of their other kind of sales pitches was that they were swords made out of recycled leaf springs from heavy trucks and railroads. Uh, that was actually their byline. We sell swords made of heavy carbon spring steel, I think is what they used to say. And I actually had a couple from back then, and they were big and they were clunky and they were fantasy swords. Well, as the 90s drew to a close and the 2000s dawned, um, the market started demanding of these sword manufacturers more historic uh, reproduction builds. And so along with some designs they already had and some new designs that were apparently come from Bruce Burkhart, this was one of the swords that we got. This nice, you know, crusader style sword a la eh, 11th, 12th century or so. Nice cruciform hilt, the nice uh, Teutonic uh, Crusader cross kind of enameled here on the pommel. Has a nice construction to it. Also, really nice scabbard. Um, and this is something that I kind of harp on occasionally with nice European swords coming with a nice scabbard. You know, swords that are touted as being very high quality often. Uh, you are required to buy the scabbard separately and, all, and almost always those scabbards for those swords, I won't mention what makes I'm referring to, uh, often cost either as much or more than the sword itself because they have to be custom made. Personally, I think those makes, and I'm sure you are aware of what I'm talking about, um, I think they can afford to probably give you a scabbard. But in this case, we got a nice one. And the nice thing about it is pops right in and for those of you who don't like them shaking and rattling too much this doesn't shake at all and it doesn't come out very easy either personally it's not necessarily a make it or break it kind of um, uh, attribute for me but for those of you who like it there you go so back to kind of the the history lesson a little bit back in the early 2000s um, uh, they were known as uh, Generation 2 or just Gen 2 at the time. They decided to go with some more historic builds. And apparently one of the other things they also did was they started to lighten up their blades and change some of the metallurgy behind how they designed some of their blades. The result apparently were some serious quality control issues. And the result was actually a lot of customers going elsewhere and to the point where Generation 2 was sold. They were, um, they were bought by CAS Iberia or CAS Iberia, however you want to pronounce it. And uh, one of the results, actually there were several results of CAS Iberia um, buying them. One of the things was that they changed the steel of a lot of their swords, this one included. This one has a nice 5160 blade to it, which as you guys know, um, or if you don't know, is a pretty good steel to use, especially for European swords. It's a spring steel, 
It's got a heavy uh, chromium and silicon content, and that allows it to have that nice, you know, springy quality. It just gives it, it has a nice jiggle to it, um, and gives it that nice quality that you want in a European sword. And um, what uh, Legacy Arms has done, of course, that's the new name ever since Casiberia bought them. They changed the blades to 5160, started hot peening the handles. And uh, outside of that, I don't know any major changes, except they did some design changes to some other swords, namely their Black Prince model. Uh, it's a sword I'm actually interested in taking a look at one of these days from Legacy Arms. Um, but overall, this sword is actually pretty well built, except for one thing, and here's my one, my one gripe with this sword, and that is the end. <laughs> If you guys look at the profile of that end, it is basically just straight and then pfft, right there at the end. I would have preferred, number one, perhaps some distal taper as we get down to the end of the sword here at least, and possibly some blade taper when it comes to the actual profile of the blade, the actual blade shape. Um, I think what that would end up doing is without compromising the overall look and construction of the sword would lighten up a whole lot. As it is, Legacy Arms swords have been referred to in other reviews, not necessarily this model, but ones definitely built like this model as choppers. And I can kind of see why. When you move this thing around, you feel all the weight right there. I mean, you can really feel this thing dip in. When you guys see my cutting footage of this, you'll see when I first swung this, swung this thing around, swang, when I first swung this thing around, it just, you feel this huge dip. I mean, well, my arms are getting a real workout working with this thing. This thing is at least uh, three and a half to four pounds. And normally I am dealing with, used to dealing with heavy swords, but this one really, you really feel it at the tip. The thing is I can't complain about that whole, a whole lot because the construction of it is so well done. And they've got such a nice scabbard to go along with it. Now it doesn't have the, uh, the raised ring uh, sections on the scabbard for like a, a belt system or anything, but quite honestly, you really don't need it. Um, if you get a nice medieval belt, it'll wrap around this just fine. You won't won't necessarily need that. The blade was sold what I would call sword sharp. Now here's an interesting thing about how sharp this sword is. It doesn't really have to be. When you guys see the, the cutting footage, it's going to demonstrate what just, you know, uh, having a large amount of mass between a blade does and the importance of it and not having it necessarily need to be you know razor sharp like a katana or something um, instead get it decent sharp and the weight of the blade will do a lot of the work um, and this sword did not disappoint in that category believe it or not when I first got it out I found it very easy to move around now point control, that was something else. I found the point very hard to control and put where I wanted to because of how much weight is sitting on the end there. That's a downside. This is not a sword that you're going to probably want to casually take in the backyard and practice tatami mat cutting with. Mainly because you are going to feel worn out by the time you're done. However, this is not a sword that's going to fail you for some nice backyard cutting. And so, you know, this is, this is going to give some of these other brands out there a pretty good run for their money. These swords run around $300. And so, you know, it really puts it up in that category of, you know, competing with swords like Ronin Katana or some of Cold Steel's European models. You know, that, that kind of, uh, some of Hanway's other stuff uh, that they've got as far as European swords are concerned. It puts it in that category, but the one thing that Legacy Arms is known for, and that this model did not disappoint in, is how nicely heavy built it is. Um, so uh, the, the short answer of the question, is it worth your money? I'd say, yeah, it is, depending on what you want to do with it. This is not going to be a sword you're going to take to long point 
or you're going to take to any kind of uh, HEMA or ARMA uh, cutting contest with mainly because those contests usually involve long swords. This is not a long sword. This is a, a much earlier medieval sword, a la the Crusades. Uh, I tend to like the Crusader period, and it's uh, it was a it, it was a real fun sword. What you've got coming up in some of the footage that you're going to be seeing ahead of time here is, of course, the unboxing. Uh, we're also going to see some footage of a little bit of a controversy when it's come to. Uh, some statements that have been made about not only this sword but legacy arms in general so I hope you guys will stick around for that then of course we've got the cutting footage and some stats on the sword itself I hope this will be informative for you I hope this little intro has been informative for you and uh, we'll see you at the end of the video and we'll see you next time for now bye bye for now we're looking here at the packing of the, uh, or should the unpacking, of the Teutonic War Sword designed by Bruce Bookhart for Legacy Arms. Now, as I mentioned in the intro summation here, I got this from a company called Buy the Sword, which you just saw there. Uh, it's a company that I actually bought swords from a long time ago when I was first collecting swords. Actually, I haven't bought from them in quite a while. Um, but this is a make that they have that they have carried for a very long time. And this make, as I said before, comes from the Philippines, the Legacy Arms, even though it is now a, uh, I guess, a, a subdivision of Cass Iberia is the way it is now um, they are still made in the Philippines and <laughs> they, it comes it doesn't get any more rudimentary than wrapped in newspaper with pieces of cardboard uh, covering the the cross guard so nothing really fancy here underneath though it's all tightly wrapped in cellophane both the scabbard and then the sword inside the scabbard still in cellophane now that's um i can't remember if it was attached or not no it was it was a uh, it was kind of cellophane to the outside of the uh, of the scabbard so as i kind of pull it away here you'll you'll see that now this company does things the old way and when I mean old when you see that sword wrapped in that clear plastic underneath is this thick gooey substance that I only ref heard referred to once as something called cosmoline and unless you've ever heard of it before um, the it, it, it's a it's a material that it's kind of a cross between um, motor oil and and uh, and Vaseline. It is this thick, gooey substance that is an absolute <laughs> nightmare to clean off. But on the on the plus side, um, you're pretty much guaranteed that this stuff once encased in it is not going to get to you with any kind of of rust on it it's a material that's really designed to hold these things uh, or to, to store these things for very long periods of time which always kind of makes me wonder well how long has this been how long has this model been in storage um but you know re regardless of how it was this is how it came to me and it takes a while to get all that stuff off. Um, it takes a lot of, you know, cleaning and rubbing that stuff off. It's great for when you're, you know, obviously transporting it, um, you know, across the ocean. But, you know, once you have it, as a private owner, you kind of want to get rid of it. So here's the sword, taking a look at it. The polish on the blade is, it's nice, it's got a nice polish on it, 
but you can definitely see the the grinding wheel, the uh, the Scotch Bright uh, strokes on it. There's the the peen pommel uh, with its kind of enameled in uh, Teutonic cross. Now, one of the things that I noticed when I first got this thing out was that it is tip heavy. And I mentioned this before in the summation, you'll hear me mention it again when we uh, look at the cutting for it, but it, it was definitely tip heavy, but it had actually a pretty decent temper, nice spring to it. Uh, we'll be talking about that in a little bit as far as a little bit of a controversy with that is concerned. And surprisingly enough, it actually cut through paper okay. You know, here I'm kind of dragging it through it, but it did all right. It had what's called a sword sharp uh, edge to it and with a sword that has this kind of weight behind it you'll soon we get into the cutting that's pretty good now in this section here uh, I actually did find one other person on YouTube who is uh, who was a, a reviewer of it Luger monger and if I got that pronounced wrong I, I do apologize <clears throat> so, just to give you an idea of th this guy's background, apparently he had been, and he kind of is going on here, about the fact that he's primarily a knife owner. In fact, if you go onto his webpage, he primarily looks at uh, uh, combat folders and, and knives of various shapes and size. Someone said, you know, you really need to get a sword, and he's like, okay, fine. And he so decided to get this one. He decided to get the uh, Legacy Arms. Teutonic War Sword, designed by Bruce Brook Brookhart. And he's uh, he's obviously cleaned it up, and he actually uh, he really enjoyed it. His his review of it was was pretty positive. And what was even funnier was when he said this. Apparently, a bunch of people who were urging him on to get a sword said, "You know, you got to get like a, a Japanese katana." And he said, "Nah, man, I'm gonna get a I'm gonna get a sword." <laughs> That's not to say the katanas aren't swords. It's just his own. I guess you could say bias toward what he really thought was a sword. So here he is. Um, he did another video where he did a little bit of cutting with it. Um, he did find it, you know, the same kind of weight um, issues with it that it was big. But you know what? He he enjoyed cutting with it. It did what he wanted it to do. Um, one of the things that stand he's got, I guess, is some old kind of wooden nightstand. At one point in the in his cutting. He whacked the thing, showing just how kind of really tough it was. So, some new interesting information that's out there on this particular model. At this point in the video, I wanted to talk about an interesting controversy when it comes to Legacy Arms swords. Now, first of all, I wanted to show you where I got it from. I got it from a website called Buy the Sword. You may have already mentioned this. Uh, sorry if this is repeat information. And uh, just kind of scrolling down here to go to where I wanted to go to. Um, here we go. Brickhard Teutonic War Sword by Legacy Arms. So click on that. Get an idea of the different uh, specs on it. This stuff will show up obviously in the spec section of the video, but just giving you an idea of what it's uh, made of and uh, where I got it. Now, this is interesting because even though it's made of 5160 steel, something that came up as I was researching this sword was something that I actually found on a different website. It's actually a website that I often go to when I'm shopping for these swords. And that's our old friend Cult of Athena. Cult of Athena usually, you know, pretty competitive as far as their pricing is concerned here. They're actually offering just as much, so I assume the difference probably is shipping. Uh, they've got all the same technical information here. Um, but here's an interesting thing at the bottom. I'm going to highlight it here on the screen. And it says, although the manufacturers considers these as battle-ready weapons, battle-ready being in quotations, we have found the blade tempers too soft for us to list them as such on some of the longer-bladed swords. Now, they have this 
notification just on their their long pieces in other words not their daggers and just their their swords and um this made me start searching for why it is that a, a reputable uh, distributor like cult of athena would make that kind of notation for this particular brand of sword and this model in particular What's interesting is that I went back to buy the sword, I actually called them up. Um, I actually know that buy the sword has distributed this model for some time um, and actually has been a distributor of Legacy Arms, AKA Generation 2 um, arms for quite a while, it's like over 20 years. And I talked with them and I, I said, you know, I'm sure you've heard of Cult of Athena and here was a notation on their website concerning this particular model and for that matter, several of their models. And they said, news to us, <laughs> I found that kind of interesting. So I did a little bit more research and I actually typed in, you know, Cult of Athena's claim about legacy armed swords, blah, 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 blah. And... <coughs> <coughs> Sorry, guys. Lo and behold, what I find out. Sword Buyer's Guide. Sword Buyer's Guide had a number of articles on uh, Legacy Arms. And look what I found. Boom. They actually had an article talking about Legacy Arms and Cult of Athena's claim that their tempering is bad. But is it true, it says. And they've got a number of testimonials here that um, that basically, I wouldn't say flat out refutes Cult of Athena's claim, but they certainly don't. They certainly don't confirm it either. And here's you know here's another one. Here's one by Brett where. Uh, he says, KOA gets it wrong sometimes. Um, and these are testimonials. Obviously, now here's the thing that you have to look at and, and, and consider. And that is, in fact, if you go back here and look under here. Oh, look at that. Generation 2 swords. They do sell them. So, you know, <laughs> they, they make... They, they they are you know in they are defending their um, they are defending these these products because they're selling them um, here's a little thing on Bruce Brookhart the guy who designed the swords uh, previously worked for MRL museum replicas in the 90s and then I guess in 2000s moved over to uh, legacy <coughs> legacy arms where he was uh, designing some of these swords. I'll talk a little bit more about that in the wrap up, but that's kind of give an idea of, of uh, where they're made. Here are some interesting things about them. Apparently in the early 2000s, um, sometime, you know, after I had been collecting them, they did kind of try and rework some of their swords and the result was some bad tempers and uh, we don't mean in people's pocketbooks um, and apparently what happened was it got so bad that they were bought out they were actually bought out by guess who CAS Iberia or Cas Iberia however you want to pronounce that and um, you know, of course, they're going to show you where to buy them. It's called right here at Sword Buyer's Guide. But the interesting thing about this is that they actually have an extensive amount of literature talking about not only Legacy Arms in particular, but if you go over here, um, they've also got a big thing about <coughs> <coughs> about the, the Black Prince sword and the various iterations that it's gone through. Which, um, here we go. Yeah, there's the various iterations of the Black Prince sword. Uh, this one's very old. And they kind of go through a bunch of different... <coughs> a 
they go through a bunch of different iterations, but we're getting kind of off, off the topic. The point is that they've got quite a bit of uh, stuff addressing this issue of Cult of Athena and what they're saying about it. I'll put the, 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 the link to this at the bottom of the video, but just an interesting thing. And one little last note, although it isn't about this. <laughs> so one more interesting thing, although it isn't about this model in particular, and that was another notation on the By the Sword website, although, like I said, it wasn't about this particular model. It's about their, um, uh, where is it? There it is. Their Black Prince Sword, which I'm thinking I might want to get a hold of. And here's a very interesting note. Take a look at this. We tested on several 2x4s standing up and split them with no marring on the blade. We tested it on 2x4 crossways resting on each side on a solid rest and came straight down. It did not cut all the way through, but it did cut deep and again did not mar the blade or edge. We went to the ultimate test, steel on steel. We did nine good blows. It nicked the blade, did not break the blade, the tang or handle in either of these tests. So you'd be interested to see what they really did, but obviously at some point, someone's made some claims about some of the legacy armed swords, and um, people are having to come back and say, well, okay, here is actually the real deal. So I, I suppose it's a bit of a, a buyer beware kind of go into it knowing that there is some controversy concerning this company and and um, what their swords really are designed to and not to do. Cutting with this sword was very interesting. On one hand, it had that extremely very weighty tip that almost lost a third of the sword. You can see I'm just kind of, I am kind of exaggerating it there, but I'm kind of exaggerating to prove the, the point that I've been talking about throughout this video, and that is it, it is rather tip heavy. Um, but it is that classic, you know, uh, crusader style of, of sword. I know there's a name for the blade geometry and oak shots number, da 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 da. I know that's the case. I just like prefer to refer to it as a crusader style sword because what that does is it puts it in a certain time period. We're looking at, you know, we're looking at uh, 11th, 12th, 13th, you know, low 13th century kind of stuff here. <clears throat> it's got room enough for two hands, but I would not call it a hand and a half sword. It's definitely that, you know, that crusader style where. The handle was obviously long enough for two hands, but not really designed for it. This is not quite the era of of a uh, of a hand and a half sword or bastard sword, if you want to use that term. Um, this was definitely that crusader style of the, the long bladed cruciform sword that could be you know easily swung and used from a horse and just you know plow a. Saracen right in two, which was what they were designed to do. Um, now, as far as cutting was concerned, the blade on this thing was so long that I really could stay away from all these targets. And there you go. It was it was a lot of fun to to work with. Now I use primarily just milk bottles because milk bottles, if you get them right, you get that nice static cut with them where they don't fly all over the place. But at the same time, this sword did show that, you know, even though it did have a, uh, a sharp blade, you can see that in some cases it does tend to bash. But, you know, in those two cases, it just filleted more of the, the, the bottle off the top. So it was, it was more a case of, you know, how I guess you swing the thing. You know, nice uh, postri da Falcone right here, right through. Nice cut. It's always nice to cut these things and still have, you know, the base still left and be able to get a little bit more out of them. And, um, but this thing was actually really fun to swing around. It's just an excessively long blade. 
but you know what it could have easily been a historical one now here is where that blade geometry really comes in handy now that is cardboard that has sat outside gotten wet and then dried again and look at this thing it cleaved it almost in half it was unbelievable how far that sword went down and now mind you the sword had a decently sharp blade but then it had the weight behind it and that is where these European swords really have their strength and that is if you've got just a decent amount of weight behind it and you've got a, a decent size a decent sharp blade it doesn't really matter that it be you know shave off the back of your arm sharp it doesn't need to be it's going to do that much damage because of the mass behind the blade <clears throat> now in um, a couple other of my videos, people have given me some slack about using WD-40 on these, you know, high carbon steel blades. This is 5160, which is still a high carbon steel. It just has some other elements in it to give it that more springy quality. But the WD-40 really does, it washes off some of the residue from, you know, whatever used to be in some of the bottles. And then, of course, when you go off to, to, uh, to store it, you might want to use a, a heavier oil. I often use three-in-one oil, which is a you know a nice easy oil to find around the house.